Okay, so do you have any other, if you have any other questions, remarks, suggestions, or critics? Okay. Well, um, I have several questions, but I limit myself to uh, really a uh, very few ones. One question uh, addressed to uh, uh, Professor Kramer uh, has to do with funding, precisely, because you mentioned the proportion of the top universities receiving funds, but you didn't mention the investment, the real investment in university studies. That is, uh, uh, the, obviously, there must have been a growth. My question has to do with the proportions of this growth as compared to the number of students, for example. You might use, of course, other indicators of academic development, but that could be uh, one, one specific question. And another question also related to Japan. How comes that the Japanese system was growing precisely in the very last period uh, before the war up to a level which was, to my knowledge, one of the highest in the world at that time. I, I think only the United States had similar levels of enrollment in, for, for an age group of 2024. So how comes, where does, well, when's the resources, uh, and how is it possible that in the midst of the war you have a tremendous growth? So. <coughs> <coughs> Reply immediately, or do you want to collect? I want to collect. Okay. Um, a question for three of you. That uh, all of these countries, uh, more or less, in the uh, uh, questions periods, for one part of the periods was quasi dictatorships or semi dictatorships. So. Uh, 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 Re s s several uh, anti-democratic elements. If you uh, uh, would like to uh, uh, describe the uh, role of uh, emigration of uh, 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 professors when the uh, uh, dictatorships uh, appears and coming back of professors when the uh, uh, dictatorships disappear. How is it relevant uh, or is it relevant in that kind of questions what you uh, 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 described or uh, uh, it's uh, or only the home persons who was in the dictatorship professor and became in the democratic systems professors. So who were the dominant? The income, uh, the new incomers, a new uh, dissident, or the, or, or the home uh, uh, group? Questions? <clears throat> you all mentioned uh, a process of creation of new universities. Uh, do you see any uh, uh, pattern in the process of creation of universities faced with the growth of population of students? Uh, for example, to what extent uh, governments and ministries face uh, the increasing number of students by uh, uh, increasing the size of existing universities as opposed to creating uh, totally new uh, institutions. Is there any uh, regularity in the historical period that you observe on uh, uh, this issue? You can start answering these questions, and then we can <coughs> also collect some or something else if you want. Just who wanna start? <laughs> well, if you want me to start, then, <laughs> then I'll start. <clears throat> Although I was the last speaker. Um, okay, the easiest question is the one about emigration. Um, 
there was no, not a single immigrant from a Japanese university anywhere during the period of fascism or ultranationalism or whatever you want to call it. In fact, even if you look at the broader intellectual landscape beyond universities, uh, you can basically count all the immigrants on, on, on your two hands. There were a couple of very prominent communist leaders that went to Moscow and uh, China, and that's it, period. A uh, fact that's very embarrassing for Japanese intellectuals after 1945 and led to much soul searching. There's no immigration, period. Um, the um, last question on new universities, which was probably directed at all three of us, I suppose, because uh, there was talk about uh, creation of new universities in all three papers. The period that I was talking about today, um, uh, the creation of so-called new universities was not a reaction to demand, but it was a political decision. And as I, as I said, it, <coughs> it was basically just amalgamating existing institutions. Um, and I also mentioned that basically those 70 odd uh, national universities are almost the same we have today. So uh, the Japanese state did not react by creating new central state universities. It, it expanded the existing ones to some degree. But really, um, a large part of the, the growing demand from the 60s onwards, specifically, is taken up by the private universities, as I uh, indirectly mentioned in Japan. Um, why did universities grow in the 1930s? Why did student numbers grow in the 1930s? Um, this is actually uh, 30s and even early 40s. Um, this has actually been my central question in, in my book, so I'm thankful that you raise it here. Um, because it looks kind of counterfactual that you have a, an oppressive fascist regime and it expands higher education, really, <coughs> uh, consciously. <coughs> Excuse me? And even during the war, whenever you want to... Mm, whenever you want to uh, see the war uh, starting here. Um, the thing is that um, there was, in fact, a, a, um, a large consensus, a broad consensus on social equality being a, a shared ideal in Japanese society uh, among the elites, um, not connected at all to liberalism or democracy, um, but um, basically ra raising uh, the, the social level, social equality, and especially through education, education being basically the primary means to achieve that, was very important in Japanese discourse, specifically through the statist alternationalist period. Um, so one of the things that happens is that there's a large consensus on expanding education in all spheres. Even women's higher education expanded substantially in that period, and specifically higher education overall. Uh, the state had, um, after the economic slump around 1931, the world economic crisis, uh, was the first of the international industrialized states that uh, took on again, um, parallel to, to Germany, in uh, um, achieving economic growth. So we have a, a wave of um, heavy industrialization <coughs> um, starting them in the early 1930s, which allows the state to actually uh, generate the revenue to pay for this kind of expansion. Um, so this is sort of the socioeconomic background here. Um, of the expansion of higher education. Mm. So um, there was one more point I wanted to raise here. I, I, for, I forget. The, the, your first question, I, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't quite understand. Um, as I already said to the other gentleman, uh, the investment, oh yeah, the, the figures I gave you, the finance figures, were indeed only basic financing, basically the annual basic financing. Yeah, I don't have, uh, I, I don't know by heart the, the other um, other um, investment money, for example, that they gave. As I just mentioned, there isn't that much reaction to student demand um, that generates investments in the, in the central state sector, um, I would say. I would have to look a bit more carefully at the whole post-war period uh, for this kind of statement. Um, as you could hear, I was focusing more on the, on the political changes immediately after, after the post-war, uh, after the end of the war. Um, and uh, the state, which is also heavily involved in controlling private, the private sector, I should add, so it's not a very, it's not a very free private sector, that, that, but the state really has quite tight control, had and has quite tight control of the private sector as well, so it's basically using that. It's also subsidizing the private sector uh, considerably, um, up to, up to uh, 10, between 10 and 20 percent of the basic funding of private universities is uh, borne by the Japanese central state. So um, again, it's also working through, through, that, through that venue to uh, react to student <coughs> demand. 
I think those were the points that I could answer to feasibly. Yes. In my presentation, I didn't speak about funding. Um, it's important to note that um, universities continued to be free of charge during all the period of my paper. Um, that uh, status began with Peron in 1950 and continued until today. Univers uh, public universities are free. And funds were uh, from a state budget. I don't have numbers, uh, neither percentages, but uh, it's important to note that uh, all the university funding was from a national budget. Uh, about the, the professors dismissed and, and re-entering, um, during both periods, um, there was a permanent conflict. In 1945-1946, anti-Peronist professors, many anti-Peronist professors, were dismissed. In 1955, many Peronist professors were dismissed and re-entered the anti-Peronist professors. Um, there was a difference. I, I think it, it's, it, it must be noted that uh, in general terms, a scientific, scientific level um, of uh, the anti-Peronist professors dismissed in 1945 was higher, uh, were uh, sci scientists uh, of m more importance than the, the Peronist ones that replaced them. Um, an important example is uh, Bernardo Usai, is one of uh, Nobel Prizes, one of the few Argentinian Nobel Prizes, that was a, a noted anti-Peronist uh, who signed a statement um, um, asking for return of democracy in 1945, and he was dismissed, and uh, he was the, the leader of an important um, school of medicine uh, until his death, and he returned to be a professor in uh, 1955 to 1966. And then the scientific level in general was uh, higher than in the previous period. Um, many professors went with external grants to Europe or to the United States and returned to Argentina during the 60s. You know? So the um, um, the scientific level uh, was improved during the second period that I studied. <coughs> uh, there was a question about whether expansion took place within existing universities or through founding new universities. Um, well, I think in terms of, of Western Europe, at any rate, uh, the initial reaction of states is to try to channel expansion into various forms of technical or vocational education, and then it's only perhaps in the 1980s or, or thereabouts that they give in, as it were, and say, yes, we call those universities, um, and you end up with 100, 200 universities. Um, it's interesting that in Britain, when the first new post-war university... Microphone a bit closer. Sorry. Um, in Britain, the first new post-war universities were founded at the beginning of the 1960s, but on very traditional college lines. And there's a conference uh, in November in London on these called the Utopian Universities because they have the idea of a, a very small community, which is what a university is about, and therefore it wasn't... Uh, the idea of a mass university at all, but of trying to expand according to existing models, which ultimately proves unviable. So I think that is perhaps a wider pattern as well. Okay. So do we have any, any further intervention?
Professor Karadi. Well, not really questions, it's maybe remarks about the topics that have been raised. One uh, remark has to do with the way new universities are created. And there are other models uh, than just uh, following the demand. Uh, I'm referring here to the French model of the late 19th century, where new uh, establishments, new institutions of higher education were created following functional uh, models. That is, new functions were given to new institutions. And uh, the, in, in the history of the Napoleonic University, you can always follow this duality or triality of functional differences between institutions of higher education, following particularly the way they are funded and the way they are operating. And the main, one of the main differences has to do with the fact whether research is involved in the operation of the uh, institution concerned or not involved. Now, the Napoleonic system was based on a level of non-involvement of research in university creation and university operations. And research was something like a decorative uh, addition. But real research was done outside. And there is another functional difference in the French system that you have the parallel system, the parallel network of the grand écoles, the big state schools, which have specific, which respond to specific state demand to train high-level civil servants. Now, this functionally different, uh, functionally differentiated model is maybe quite unique up to a degree, but you find some kind of reminiscences to this in Eastern Europe after Sovietization, because in the Soviet system you have this, uh, something uh, of a comparable model of institutions doing research and institutions, institutions, universities teaching only. So this is just a side remark about how new institutions, academic institutions, may be created, uh, brought about. My second remark would have to do with a, a big problem area. I think we can't solve it here, but it's worth to be reflected upon whether uh, university uh, expansion has to do with state policies of investments or public, otherwise public policies of investment because universities may be created by the churches, by civil societies, etc. So investments uh, uh, creating the expansion of uh, student bodies or the massification, that is the expansion of the demand uh, is uh, bringing about new institutions. So whether the university market, to put it that way, is a demand-based market or a supply-based market. I have the feeling that up to the First World War, uh, the universities in most European countries were basically supply-based markets. And after the First World War, especially after the Second World War, you start to have a demand-based uh, development of universities, but this is, of course, debatable. Uh, telling the truth, it was a shocking information for me that that was no uh, one uh, Japan uh, immigrant, because, uh, for example, uh, if you see the uh, German-Japanese academic uh, relations. There were several Japan students uh, in Germany in the uh, end of 19th uh, uh, century and the early of uh, uh, 20th century, which means that there were uh, relevant living uh, connections between the uh, uh, Germany and, and uh, Japan, for example. How is it possible that the uh, Weimarian uh, Germany, which is the, uh, which was in some meaning the, the best way or best place in, in Europe for, 
for uh, intellectual uh, 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 freedom and uh, how is it possible that there were no uh, uh, Japanese emigration uh, to Germany? How, what, what do you think if it's there, perhaps there are no uh, exact information what not happened, I understand, but what, what do you think? How is it possible? Very complex topic. Uh, again, probably more fit for tomorrow when we're talking about personnel. Um, in fact, uh, the only Japanese, I think, that were in Germany in the 1930s were fascists. And so um, they were not immigrants, but precisely the opposite. They were uh, <clears throat> cultural propagandists of the, the new imperial Japan. Um, um, and the kind of Japanese that tended to, to go to Germany, and of course there were Japanese students abroad, uh, advanced students abroad, uh, all over the world basically, uh, but the kinds of students that w t tended to go to Germany in the 1920s studied with Heidegger and the likes. So they were not precisely those that you would expect to emigrate perhaps in the 1930s when Japan turned upon the, the f fascist road. Um, the, the, whole compli the whole problematic is really um, quite a complex one um, because you did have a fairly strong left-wing movement in Japan in the 1920s. Uh, wh where did that go? Um, um, you have a pattern of public recantations in the early 1930s. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, it's also sometimes translated as conversions. Um, basically, left -wing, leaders of the left-wing movement are pressured into recanting their former belief, so to speak, and publicly embrace the emperor and all that the Japanese state stands for. Um, and the Japanese state and its uh, suppressing organs are very successful with that, and that basically annihilates the movement in the, in the early 1930s. That's the communist movement. Um, there's very little liberalism in the sort of emphatic sense to begin with in Japan. You have uh, very, very little... Um, liberal philosophers, liberal thinkers, uh, very non-existent liberal movement. It's, it's a very statist picture. You're either a socialist Marxist in the 1920s or you're, you're an imperialist sort of supporter of the imperialist expansionist state. So that, that mainly explains why there's no um, immigration from the universities uh, where there, there are no Mar few Marxists that lose their jobs, I should say. I mean, I've talked about uh, dismissals and reinstatements. They, they just don't go abroad. They, they, go into the inner immigration, as uh, the, the German word has it. Um, I would like to, if, if I may, I, I don't want to <laughs> monopolize the time here. I would like to comment on one thing that the gentleman there said and on two things that uh, Robert Anderson said. Uh, functional differences within the higher education system are the norm rather than the exception, aren't they? I mean, if you look at systems worldwide, there's always waves of differentiating the system and then putting it back together again, if I think of you know, the polytechnic universities that uh, Robert was re referring to earlier, that then, sort of, as you said, they reluctantly admit them to, to, be, uh, to become universities in the 1980s, the Fachhochschulen in Germany that are still existing. The two-tiered or multi-tiered systems aren't all that exceptional at all, and of course they're functionally differentiated. The Japanese case might be the exception because it had a very functionally differentiated system until 1945, which was then sort of forced together into a, outwardly unified system, and of course everybody who knows anything about universities in Japan will, will tell you, well, they're all called universities, but of course there are you know, five tiers or something, and we, we can tell very well this really, if they really cater to teacher training, and they really cater to producing bureaucrats in the, in the national ministries and things like that. So I, I'd say it's a, it's a much more universal uh, pattern, possibly. Um, again, you know, uh, subject to, to reform and change, but um, sort of in, in, in a wave pattern. And uh, to, to your comment, which I uh, thought was really uh, um, suggestive, I um, completely agree that, as you said, autonomy is not necessarily a corollary of a, of a liberal state or, or liberal society. I mean, if you, if you do associate autonomy with 19th century Germany, then there, there's the proof already <laughs> there in your hand, right? Obviously, a very authoritarian state that that still has a university system with, with strong autonomy in, in the university system. So, um, but uh, more importantly, you, you said that, well, we have our two models, the centralized state model, 19th century France, the university autonomy model, 19th century Germany, and then I think you even said in a footnote that the, the Americans clearly tried to impose the, the latter in Japan after 1945. 
And I would strongly argue that that is definitely not the case, but that um, at the latest, by that time, mid 20th century, we have a third model, which is the American model, the US American model, that is neither of the two, but that is uh, at least sort of on the rhetoric level, it's very much about public accountability um, at the more regional and local level. And this is what they try to, to institute in, in Japan. And incidentally, also what they tried to institute in Germany. I mean, they, they didn't come and see, oh, look here, we have uh, university autonomy, traditional, great, let's just revive it. But they, they really wanted to do something about it, except they, they failed miserably because, you know, there, there was, a, I said there was no one on the Japanese side who supported it. There was even fewer people on the, on the German side who wanted, wanted anything but re return to the, to the pre-Nazi system. So I think they're really, by that time, three quite clear models of how state, society, and universities interacted with each other that also, I think, um, people, uh, the historical actors that we look at uh, articulated uh, consciously. I mean, they, they, they spoke in those terms, um, even sometimes referring to, say, the, the, the German model or so on. And I think they explicitly, the Americans that I looked at uh, in, in, that were active in Japan explicitly rejected that model and said, you know, that's nice for, for a small elite, perhaps, group of schools, but that, that doesn't work for the kind of new university system we want to have. Further question, comments? Okay. Just to make things even more complicated, I would say that liberalism and uh, autonomy may be uh, combined, but may not be combined, because there are several cases in 20th century university development where universities had a large degree of autonomy and they themselves became illiberal to a large extent. Well, I'm not, I can quote many examples. One would, one would be, for example, American liberal universities of the Ivy League College who had anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish quotas up to the 60s, the 1960s, okay? So, absolute autonomy and formal liberalism with very illiberal results. Now, I'm not uh, referring to Central European universities, where universities themselves in uh, Romania, in Hungary, in Austria, started to be within their uh, autonomy to be highly illiberal, particularly anti-Semitic after the First World War. So you have uh, all kinds of local combinations of illiberalism, liberalism, and autonomy, academic autonomy. Okay, thank you. So, if you have any other question, comments? Okay, so let me thank our speakers and our discussants. Uh, and now we can stop the panel for, for now and Thank him.